Welcome to Delightfully Dysfunctional, a podcast about navigating the emotions of the human condition and the challenges that come with it. I'm Kehlani Persian Mason, a psychotherapist and life coach with James Timmons and Ever Curious Human. This is not a replacement for mental health therapy. Please seek out mental health care if that's what you're needing. This is an opportunity for self healers to dive deep and understand more about themselves. I'm so excited to welcome Jonathan Robinson to the podcast. He has written somewhere between 14 and 15 books, and they've been translated in 47 languages that have reached over 200 million people around the world. So that's really impressive, and we are excited to have him here. He's been featured on Oprah and CNN, as well as having his own training program for teaching therapists to do uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and his podcast, Awareness explorers. So thank you so much for being on the Delightfully Dysfunctional podcast. Uh, Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thank you, Kilani. I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Yeah. You know, I I always find it's so interesting kind of how people find themselves in this helping field. And so I'd love to know a little bit about your origin story, actually, as we kick off and get to know you. What is it um, that led you to this path? Well, I was blessed to have a uh, delightfully dysfunctional uh, upbringing, childhood. Yes. Uh, there was a lot of violence in my family, mm. a lot of arguing. And um, so at age 12, I ran away from home for a while, and then uh, they found me, came back. But I got into self-help stuff. <laughs> um, I got into self-hypnosis and meditation and also drugs. And... I was looking for a way, you know, out of my pain and yeah. depression. And uh, those things really started to lift me out of that over time. Uh, so I got very lucky that I started early. My brother and sister uh, weren't so lucky, and they've had a really hard time mm. in life. But um, I've been very blessed to really ask for help, get help, and, and move along in a spiritual path and help millions of people. Yeah, to learn how to navigate that. That's beautiful. Um, As you were sharing your story, I was reminded that similarly, some of the delightfully dysfunctional aspects of my home led me on this path as well. And one of the people that I believe you interviewed for a previous book, uh, Wayne Dyer, was one of one of the you know, my teachers and pulling me out of that space, too. So it feels that you've been passing it on ever since then. Yeah, and Wayne, Dr. Dyer was a really good guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was very supportive of my work, and um, his books helped millions as well. And he had a rough childhood. He was a uh, foster kid and um, had to be in a lot of different foster homes. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's interesting when you do get to learn more about someone's, like, the depth of their spiritual path, there does seem to be oftentimes an underlying theme there that brings Mm -hmm. someone to become an awareness explorer. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. Right, Uh, yeah. Usually pain is what gets us on the uh, spiritual Mm -hmm. path or the psychological uh, health path, and I was lucky also that around age 16, I came upon the drug MDMA, often known as ecstasy or molly, and that was very instrumental in helping me as well. I I might have the only master's thesis ever done on the value of MDMA for PTSD, because it was back in 1984, and uh, about three weeks later, they made it illegal. So... Mm -hmm. You couldn't do research on it anymore until recently. Uh, So I found that it was curing people of all their psychological remedies pretty much in a day. And so for the last 40 years, I've helped a lot of people with that as well. Wow. So pretty much for the majority of your career as a therapist, MDMA has played a role in the work that you've done with clients to some degree. Yeah, it's all been underground, meaning mm-hmm. uh, I until last year, I was not very uh, vocal about people knew me as a writer of, of 14 other books. Uh, right. <laughs> but um, it was always in the background. I probably have helped uh, led maybe seven or 800 journeys with people over the years. And as you mentioned, I teach uh, now the biggest MDMA training for coaches and therapists on how to do this type of therapy 
uh, mostly over Zoom now, mm-hmm. uh, which is a really uh, new way of doing this type of therapy. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also a certain flavor to your therapy that I've gathered just based on, on, um, what I've absorbed from the things you've put out into the world, but there's these elements of spirituality, of philosophy, of science based approach to your therapy. What was the evolution of that for you? That maybe that's a big question, but it seems to, to be something that you've added and morphed to along the way as many do. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually a simple answer. I have a a very deep spiritual religious belief system that could be summarized as use what works. Now, that's a very unique system nowadays, because everybody has their agenda, they have their their, um, category, their religion, or their psychological technique that they think is best. But what I find is that different things work for different people. So, uh, I've tried to collect data to find out what works. I've tried to uh, match people with the type of therapy that they find the most Mm -hmm. effective in the shortest period of time, because that's what I've done for myself. And it's not a very popular philosophy, believe it or not, uh, but it is one that uh, has allowed me to reach a lot of people through, you know, television and books and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a bit of like an intuitive nature to navigating what might work for someone and and, an eclectic approach. Well, on MDMA, uh, you can try a technique on somebody and you'll see if it works or doesn't work within about 60 seconds. So uh, I'll try a bunch of stuff and see what works for them. And then uh, about a week later, when they're not on the medicine, I uh, integrate the things that worked into their daily life. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so this, the book that you wrote, Ecstasy is Medicine, I have it right here. Um, I also just recently bought The Enlightenment Project, oh, another wow. book of yours, but I've not started it yet. But back to Ecstasy is Medicine. Um, I, I'm wondering what your underlying goal of the book was. Was this just to educate the public? Was this to inspire new therapists? Was this to provide hope for for people who might be suffering? What uh, was do I get, the why? Do I get a, a, a D, all of the above? All of the above? Oh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. You totally get a D. But yeah, so <laughs> to, uh, to cover all of those aspects, that was part of the why for you. Yeah, you know, also, um, there's an organization called MAPS, which funded uh, ecstasy or MDMA studies. And uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, Keilani, but it will soon get FDA approval. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's past phase three trials. Yes, very exciting. So, but MAPS uh, ended up creating a a protocol with MDMA Mm -hmm. that, in my opinion, is not as effective as it could be. Right. What they mostly do is they give people the drug and put a blindfold on them and have them listen to music mm-hmm. and hope that the pill by itself will cure people of trauma. And the studies show that it does. But the reason they did this non-therapy approach while on MDMA is because mm-hmm. it's called the Food and Drug Administration. It's not called the Food and Therapy Administration. Right. So they had to show that just the drug would cure people. And uh, But what I do is I actually do therapy while people are on the MDMA. And I find that the results are like almost ridiculously fantastic. Mm-hmm. And um, But I don't have the $30 million in the 40 years to show that result scientifically. I just have the 800 people I've worked with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to give uh, an indication of how I work with it. And then in my training... Uh, which, you know, I'm doing another one in March, Uh, I train people in my protocol that does involve various therapeutic techniques while somebody is on the medicine. Yes, I hope to be a part of that training. Oh, good. Yes, I'm excited about that. So this was maybe the right timing as well as part of what I'm hearing because of um, MDMA phase three trials and understanding the protocol that was researched there. It was kind of time for there to be another option that was brought to the surface too and understood. Yeah, you know, when it does get the FDA approval, which they think might be in June of 2024, 
Um, there'll be some clinics that open up, but they'll be charging about $15,000 for the therapy. Uh, mm. I wanted to make it so that people could access this type of therapy right. uh, for $1,000. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's a really different thing. And also, uh, I do most of it over Zoom now. So I avoid all kinds of legal problems. And to my surprise and everybody else's surprise, it actually works better over Zoom than in person. Yeah, I've shared that with a few other therapist friends and they've sat with that and we're like, oh, that actually does make sense. So it's been like a surprising thought just to play around with. Um, And I'm excited to learn those techniques. It seems that, I I mean, again, I I totally resonate with what you're saying. I don't want to provide a type of therapy that is for the elite. I want to provide Mm -hmm. healing for the masses or at least to aid in that. Um, So I think that that's a real theme it seems of like the goal of your work again, kind of the the nugget in the middle of why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, there's a few hundred million people with severe trauma. Plus, it also works for anxiety and depression. I also have used it in a spiritual way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you're in this open, peaceful, loving state that MDMA uh, creates, I ask a lot of questions as to exactly how they're creating that experience so that people have like a breadcrumb trail back to that experience when they're not on the medicine. So personally, it used to take me like an hour of meditation to get into this uh, really deep sense of love and inner peace. Now it only takes about 30 seconds because I know all these distinctions as to what allows me to open up my energy field to the same experience that I get when I'm on MDMA. Right. And there was an example I know you walked through in the book with a a client trying to find those breadcrumbs. So I thought that that was a really wonderful takeaway. Again, please buy Mm. the book. It's I highly recommend it. Um, So this gives us some ideas of how this can be a tool, not something that is in constant use or in creating you know, a dependence on the medicine, because I think we have some misconceptions to break down when we talk about MDMA assisted therapy. What are some of the main stigmas, fears or misconceptions that you come up against when you start talking about the work that you do? Well, most people think of it as a party drug you take at all night dance parties. And um, yeah, it's fun that way. But Mm -hmm. using MDMA for a dance party drug is a little bit like using a laptop as a doorstop. It works, but there's better uses for a laptop. There's better uses for MDMA. Right. It's funny that you pulled that right out because I had already written it down and highlighted it. I think that that was a great example. Exactly. So this we have the such potential for the medicine. Why not use it to its full potential and give it the, the setting to do so? Yeah, yeah. The other thing is that some people have had hard times on MDMA, like the days after, um, but usually that's because they're not actually taking pure MDMA. They're Mm. usually mixed with things like bath salt or methamphetamine. Ends up that people who take pure MDMA usually are fine the next day and don't have any hangover. So some people associate MDMA with like, oh, it's going to be really hard on my body. But Mm -hmm. that's generally not the case if you take the pure stuff. Unfortunately, about 40% of the MDMA in America is mixed with other stuff. And uh, hopefully when it becomes medically prescribed, there'll be less of that problem. Yeah, one would hope. How do you navigate um, the legality that you had mentioned? You said like doing it over Zoom makes it more legal. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that and in making sure that your clients are working with a safe, pure form of the medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, when I work with somebody or in the hundreds of therapists, coaches, healers I train in the training, um, I tell them that uh, I know somebody on Signal who Mm -hmm. gets his stuff directly from John Hopkins University so it's the absolute purest stuff possible. Right. And uh, if you want to, the, I don't say what they should do. I say what I do. I I, I tell them the number of my friend on Signal, which right. is an encrypted app. And uh, he sends people uh, the medicine for a fee. 
uh, along with a couple of supplements to take for side effects. And um, nobody has ever gone into any trouble doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just getting, you know, one dose at a time. The law enforcement, first of all, can't get into the app signal. And second, they're not concerned about people taking one dose mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. medical purposes. So that's what I do. And um, it seems to work for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. And so then this all, um, this underground work you had been doing now becomes above ground. Well, it will uh, soon. It will soon. Yes. Um, and that's why I'm training a lot of therapists. And if people want to know about the training, it's they can find out at mdmatraining.net. Um, and my goal is to get uh, thousands of healers that can do this type of training mm -hmm. because it's so effective. The course is about 30 hours of material and practice sessions. And when people, I mean, you know, it's kind of like uh, any technology that's really great. You want to make sure that a lot of people have it. You know, people have smartphones because they really are amazing. They are mm -hmm. great technology. Uh, of course, you have to learn how to use the technology effectively. Uh, mm -hmm. And things like smartphones are what I call WMDs or widgets of mass distraction. <laughs> Agreed. So what we, what we really need are are technologies that help us to heal ourselves, that help us to open to love and peace and become better human beings. And I think MDMA is probably the best thing we've ever come across. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I often have said that I think we are missing some of the natural immunity, emotional immunity that we had from having spaces to be more aware and be more mindful. Mm -hmm. And they really have been sucked up by these widgets of mass destruction or distraction, like you said. Um, yeah. And and it it's also evident by things that the, the NIH are sharing about there being a loneliness epidemic and this being the loneliest time ever. So I'm I'm wondering as well how you think um, MDMA might aid or psychedelics in, in general might aid in this loneliness issue that we're facing. Yeah, you know, I was surprised uh, when I have taught the MDMA class, one of the things that happens is there's a, uh, a telegram group where, you know, like the 200 people taking the class are all connecting. Right. You know, and making really friends, you know, over the subject. And we need to find our tribe nowadays. And it's hard uh, when you have a, an interest in things like consciousness or psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So that's been really sweet for me to watch. Um, and I think in the future, there'll be a lot of group MDMA sessions for mm -hmm. healing, like veterans. You know, uh, I did a group healing MDMA session um, with an extended family a couple of weeks ago. Wow. And they said, you know, they've been to therapists for five years. They said that did more in one day than the five years of therapy. Because when people care about each other and their hearts are open, they can work out stuff. Mm -hmm. When they are locked in their resentments, working out problems is almost impossible. So I probably worked with maybe a couple hundred couples too. And a lot of couples feel lonely. They're not connected. Oh. And the drug, the medicine helps them to connect and work through all those issues in a day rather than, you know, five years of therapy. So it's it's really magical if used in the right way. And it'll be interesting to see how it uh, affects society as a whole, you know. Yeah, that's profound. You segued right into my next question, which is about working with couples. I work with mm -hmm. a lot of couples in my practice, mm -hmm. and I'm excited to start exploring how, um, well, right now, how ketamine, a legal psycho... Um, psychedelic or psychoactive um, can help when it comes to couples, but even more so mm -hmm. MDMA makes it's such a heart opening medicine. So yeah. it's lovely to hear that you have evidence of that working and group work just makes everything so much more profound. So yeah, exploring what it might look like within a group. Um, yeah, are there current studies being done on group work with MDMA? Well, actually, MAPS uh, has asked me to do a study on MDMA's effects on couples. So that's mm. starting. Uh, there really can hasn't I be been... A, can I be a participant therapist? I volunteer. <laughs> 
Well, I'll actually be um, hopefully working with the Shift Network doing a prolonged uh, course on how to use MDMA in couples work as well. And that'll probably start in April. So there's a lot going on. I'm just, you know, trying to ride this wild horse. Um, uh, I think group stuff, there's been very little stuff done. The stuff that has been done has mostly been with veterans mm -hmm. because we have veterans, uh, several veterans kill themselves every day. Yes. And it's mostly because of their PTSD. So the Veteran Administration is looking at possibly, can we do 10 veterans at once all in MDMA and um, cure them of their trauma? And the preliminary studies look pretty good. Yes, I'm so excited. I think that that is a, a really wonderful common focus that we can all have and see as a need. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's good to hear, you know, typically we think of veterans of being maybe very tough, maybe stonewalling. And so it's really wonderful to hear um, even elite people within the military in, in high leadership really saying positive and healing things about what they've realized with psychedelics and therapy. Yes, strangely enough, the Defense Department has been very supportive of uh, making MDMA a legally prescribed drug. Yes, how need. interesting is it? Yeah. yeah. So having lived through, you know, a time when it was so uh, mm -hmm. negatively viewed and it was such a strong stigma and just true misinformation being provided to now what is being called a, like the second turning of a psychedelic renaissance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess, and maybe this is just a general question, like how how are you feeling in this phase? What can we do to continue this upward momentum as um, someone who's in the psychedelic space? Well, being informed, you know, like reading the book Ecstasy as Medicine and knowing how to use these things in a safe and therapeutic way rather than just for entertainment. You know, you could... I mean, everything can be used for good or bad. A fork can be used to uh, get food to your mouth or to poke yourself in the eye. And it's important with these powerful psychological tools that we learn how to use them in a sacred manner mm -hmm. and learn how to use them to grow spiritually and to heal our wounds quickly. You know, not everybody can afford several years of therapy. Right. But most people, you know, if they were suffering from depression or anxiety um, or, or trauma, they could afford, you know, maybe a thousand bucks to take care of that and, and know how to move forward in their life. So uh, I think being well informed and being smart about how we use this stuff is our next step as a society. Yeah, thoughtful and intentional as we move forward. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I love this quote you had once said too, you don't need to be a perfect human being to have a higher consciousness. So in regards to people who are, um, you know, working towards enlightenment and working towards uh, understanding that part of themselves, um, I, th I guess I think that there's some people who might not view that as a goal in their life. And yet I think mm -hmm. that it is a real path towards happiness. Do well, you everybody, I think, wants more love, peace and joy. You don't yeah. see people, nah, I'm not interested in love, peace or joy, you know. So I think everybody wants that. And but we don't know of, uh, you know, I've interviewed a hundred spiritual leaders ranging from the late Mother Teresa to the Dalai Lama. I used to ask them, what's the purpose of human life? And I stopped after 50 people because all 50 said the exact same thing. And I then realized, well, there's agreement among the leaders of Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, everything, Judaism, Islam on what the purpose of life is. That, that's really good. You can't get 50 scientists to agree what photosynthesis is. So, you know, that's pretty amazing. And if people want to know, they can buy the book, Enlightenment Project. No, I'll, I'll tell your audience. <laughs> but um, tell us the secret, yes. <laughs> okay. The, people say that there's two things we're here to do. First thing, find peace and love within yourself. What Jesus called the kingdom of heaven within, uh, what Buddha called your Buddha nature. That's our first thing. And, you know, we're, we haven't done that good of a job of that so far. Mm -hmm. 
mostly because it the the methods for doing that have taken too long and have been too hard. You know, I'm a lazy person. I don't want to meditate an hour a day, you know, hitting my head against the wall. I, I'd like to, but if I can find the joy, peace, and love of MDMA in five minutes, well, now you got me hooked, you know? So I help people to get to back to that place of peace and love very quickly once they know the recipe in their own body and mind as to how to get back to that place. You know, and the great thing about MDMA is it doesn't really feel like a drug. It really feels more like you at the most clear-headed, loving, and peaceful you've ever been. You know, I share a story in the book that um, my parents were always wondering why I was spending so much time, you know, in monasteries and trying to get peaceful. And I said, well, I'm, I'm really trying to get a certain feeling, a certain experience of life that's very open and loving. And they said, well, how can we do that? And I said, well, actually, there is a shortcut. You can try this drug called MDMA or ecstasy. And they said, okay, can we try it? Which surprised so, me. Yeah, were, you, right. You convinced them. I'm still yeah, working were, on that pretty, one. <laughs> they were pretty conservative. Anyway, so I gave them the medicine. I, I told them how to take it, you know, a good set and setting. Well, a year passed. I didn't hear anything about it. So I asked them, did you ever try that medicine, the MDMA? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we tried it. And I said, well, what happened? And they said, nothing happened. The drug didn't take effect. I thought that was strange. So I said, well, tell me exactly what happened that night. And they said, well, we took the medicine. We you know, planned the whole night and we waited like 20 minutes and nothing happened. Well, it ends up it takes about 40 minutes to, for the drug to take effect. So I said, well, what would you do for the rest of the night? And they said, oh, well, ended up that we talked about, we had a wonderful evening. We talked about how much we loved each other and how wonderful our lives were. And we cuddled on the couch all night. It ended up being the best night of our 40-year marriage. But the only disappointment was that the drug never took effect. <laughs> So I'm laughing the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they still thought that it was just happened to be the best night of their marriage. Because you um, convinced them that the medicine had something to do with their no, no, I never, no, I never no, was able no. to convince them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, they said, oh, then, oh, maybe, you know, like, oh, that is curious. That, that was yeah. the best night of our marriage. Anyway, so. You know, it doesn't feel like it's not like LSD or psilocybin, mm -hmm. where you know you're on a, a, you know, you're having another worldly experience. Right. This is more something that you can integrate into your daily life as a way of being open and more present to uh, your life. Wonderful. Well, this has been uh, such a treat to get to speak with you and to learn more about the methods that you use and your philosophy when it comes to not just um, not just your your work as a therapist and a healer, but as a person. Um, yeah, it, it, I, it worked for me, so I thought I'd pass it on to others. Yeah, what a gift. What a gift that, that you're sharing with the world, the, the things that you've realized and 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 the dots that you've connected. Thank you so, so much for doing what you do. Are there any parting messages that you want to share with us? Well, it's a message that I share in my podcast, Awareness Explorers. I always tell people, keep exploring until you find what works for you. Mm -hmm. If people want to know about uh, the book, they can learn about it uh, at xtcasmedicine.com or the training at mdmatraining.net. And yes. uh, there they can learn a lot about stuff or contact me. And We will and, make sure uh, to put links as well for especially these two books that we've really enjoyed here at Delightfully Dysfunctional. Um, yes, we'll make sure that people can find you. Thank you. And I really appreciate your question, uh, Kilani. And uh, so I tell your your uh, your listeners to always keep exploring. Thank you so much. That's part of our message as well to continue to be curious humans. So mm -hmm. uh, appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much, Jonathan Robinson. Enjoy You're the welcome. rest of your day.